pleasure, and thanks, thanks to all of you for showing some enthusiasm and coming to find out all about being trashed, <laughs> which my son tells me is the wrong word. He said being trashed means he got drunk on the weekend, Mom. But I think it suits, so I'm sticking with it. I did want to say a wee word about uh, process. Um, I was supposed to speak to a class this morning, and I'm sorry that I didn't. Um, because I was thinking uh, that I wanted to talk a little bit about process, uh, process being your doctoral studies <clears throat> or your graduate studies. I started off studying Interpol. And you know that in the doctoral program or in graduate programs, you have to find a niche. You have to find a gap. You have to find a lacuna in the law. You know? And so I found a little lacuna in the law having to do with Interpol. And I worked with that for two years. And um, it just wasn't interesting. It wasn't going anywhere. It wasn't interesting. I, I'm not saying Interpol isn't interesting, but they're not even an operational police force, you know. They pass out fingerprints and so on. I, I, I don't, they, don't, they, they do much more. But anyway, it wasn't interesting to me. So I literally spent a year just reading. Like reading and reading, and I, I kept gravitating to social media and the internet, and I thought to myself, you're crazy if you don't try to stay with this and figure out what's going on here, because this is huge. This is huge. So, here I am today, and I did stick with it, and I'm going, I'd like to share with you some of my thoughts on reputation and on whether the law has any business at all or any success dealing with reputation, okay? So just quickly, and Bill, you did a terrific job, so I don't need to say any of this. This is, uh, I don't know if you can see it or not, but uh, generally I'm, uh, I also teach uh, up at Osgood uh, in digital crime. Crime is sort of my thing. And um, I was a researcher in Paris, again, with, with Bill's hand in the background, uh, assisting me to uh, get accepted at Sciences Po in Paris. And those were just dream years. It was a wonderful time. And then, of course, at the Oxford Internet Institute. Um, something else that I bring to my uh, studies is that um, since 1990, I've been a criminal lawyer. And uh, I've done defense, and then when I'm not doing defense, I've done uh, what we call crown work, but it's uh, prosecutions. And um, that has given me uh, quite a view about being an officer of the court and, and watching judges struggle with the internet and technology and trying to take a new field and shoehorn it into traditional common law. And it gets acrobatic at times. It gets just silly, the, the gymnastics they go through to try and apply the law to the internet and to new technology. So I, I also call myself an internet thinker. Uh, I am a journalist. I do work with CBC, which is, uh, I guess, like your public, uh, public radio national. Or you? Public NPR and PR, isn't it? PRI. Um, and uh, I've just completed uh, a session at the University of Toronto, which is our competitor um, uh, major university uh, where, uh, we, where I am in, uh, in Canada, um, regarding social media and how to look at management and marketing and everything having to do with social, as we call it now. So today, what is reputation law? I hope by the end of this you'll, you'll have an idea about what it is. Uh, who are the targets? Well, uh, I have an image there of Gen Z, or as we say in Canada, Gen Z. And uh, those are not children who were born digital, because that, those are the millennials, but they are born mobile. They don't plug anything in, right? I imagine you know a few and they're probably in their tweens now, um, you know, between 9, 10, and the mid-teens, and uh, their world is very, very different. And they view, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, they view um, social media uh, as, a, as a very different tool than, than, than I do. So again, is there, are they going to come upon problems that the law can help with? 
And if so, the law's got to be prepared. It's got to, uh, it's got to smarten up. If we don't, uh, third point here, if we decide that law really is not uh, a good response or a good tool to help with reputation online and on the internet, then what are our alternatives? So when I've been studying this, I've looked at uh, two examples. One is that we take law out of the equation altogether and we reduce digital speech, social speech, um, to a lesser form of speech. And so when we speak about high speech and low speech, when, when people who study uh, constitutional law make reference to uh, judgments and letters as high speech or academic, academic writing as high speech, then they make reference to low speech, you know, something that's more fractured, impetuous, off the cuff, um, hyperbolic, uh, emotional. We could talk about that as low speech. So if we do that, if we reconfigure and decide that we're going to take law as a response out of the picture altogether, then um, what do we do? Do we deal them just with high speech and try to protect uh, our reputation in high speech? and just have an open season for anything that's on social media that we would consider to be low speech? Or do we actually try to provide some sort of management, reputation management, some sort of recourse for people who do get trashed, trolled, flamed, and injured online? Um, this is just very quickly a few of the publications that I've been working on and um, they come at this question, again, still dealing with reputation law, what is it, how can it help us, from a few different angles. So uh, the, the top publication just deals with speech, analyzing what we say, LOL. What does LOL really convey? And how is it perceived? And what's the intent? And so on. Uh, the second one was robotics, taking a look at artificial intelligence. And if we're trying to, we can learn a lot from people who work with human-machine interaction. When you're trying to teach a, com a computer how to talk <coughs> or how to di put together digital speech in a journal article and so on, what, what do we teach them? What do we, what do we learn about language? What we, and so on. So I think there's a, there's possible resources there for dealing with this question, um, and so on. There are a few other uh, a few other articles there. Research questions that I started to ask myself were: Is the internet? I call it ontologically different, and, and nobody really knows what ontologically means, including myself. So I, t I just said: Is the internet magically different? Is it a different uh, place? and uh, in terms of communicating and media. And so we need to think about that. And if so, then we need to think about the fact that the communication literacy itself, the words, are different. Okay? And then if that is the case, the only reason I can think of that we would bring in law to protect reputations would be that we have certain values or norms that we as a society think are important. We think it's important that we are respected amongst our peers. We think it is important that we are articulate and conversant when we talk to other people, that we are social, and so on. So, I guess we're turning to the law at times to say, can you protect those values? Can you create a status quo and guard that for us and keep us, keep us from harm? The other thing that struck me about these studies about reputation is that uh, you're not reading about reputation or thinking about it very long before you realize that you're also thinking and talking about privacy because it's your private world, it's your private name. And when someone invades your privacy, that's you, that's your reputation out there, it's out there. So 
So privacy is important and memory is important. And if you think about it, if you admire someone, you think that in your view, they have uh, a valuable reputation, then you're dealing with memory. You're dealing with what they've said, what they've done, you've been together with them perhaps, whatever. You're dealing with memory. And memory is not like a copy machine. Memory is magical again because memory is created. Memory doesn't necessarily have to reflect what actually goes on or what conversation was that was that actually had. Memory is a recreation after the fact. So in any event, you know, uh, you probably figure out this is no wonder it took me six to seven years to get through this whole thing because <laughs> because I had to think this through and I had to build this base before I could start getting very critical about the law. So, reputation is a social construct. That's essentially what we're saying, right? Everybody in this room has one. You don't really think about it until it goes or something happens to it or it becomes a little bit stained or colored, risky, right? And it's odd, but you can shape your reputation, but more than anything, others shape it for you. So most of the time, I say 99% of the time, it's out of your control, really. Because reputation is the esteem in which other people hold you. They either put you up here or they've got you down here. But it's their perception and their view. It isn't what you think of yourself. It's what they think of you as a member of their society. Um, one of the writers that I looked at is a gent called Robert Post, and uh, he commented in the, I think it was in the 80s, that one way we can look at reputation is that it is the social apprehension we have of one another. And that is one of the most paranoid definitions I've ever heard of, right? Because it's like you're constantly <coughs> looking over your shoulder thinking, gee, I wonder how my peers, how my friends are going to look at me now now that I've done that. So I thought it was pretty accurate, actually. Uh, the social apprehension we have of one another. And then for the sociologists in the group, if there are any, it's all tied into our presentation of self. And uh, good Canadian lad, Ir Irving Goffman, who mm -hmm. came to America to get famous, um, made that phrase quite uh, uh, quite controversial. Presentation of self. We we get out into the theater every day and we have that public self that we present and then we've got the backstory back here that we don't want anyone to see. But to me that's all tied into reputation, how we present ourselves. Does anyone know who this fellow is? I don't expect you to. His name is Max Mosley. And for many years, you know, no, no, uh, go no, ahead, no, go ahead. Go ahead. he was the head of Formula One racing mm -hmm. in the world. Rich, rich, rich man. He was the son of, I forget his father's first name, Rupert maybe, can't recall, uh, who uh, during the Second World War was accused of being a... Um, well, he was. A, well, I guess he was. <laughs> <laughs> All right, he was. Yeah, yeah. Sympathizer. Yeah, yeah. Traitor, I think Traitor, yeah, yeah, but okay, we can do talk. So. <laughs> All right. So here's son Max, and um, Max held a party for himself for some milestone birthday in uh, Europe, and he um, invited several people who who wore costumes during the night, and it was suggested that maybe there was a little bit of. Uh, um, paid for sex sort of thing going on, you know, party girls and escorts. Um, the News of the World decided, that it actually no longer exists, but of course it was a very strong news service in England. It decided to um, send a few uh, women undercover into the party in Nazi paraphernalia. And their job was to gather around Max and make sure that there were photographs and that these images got back to News of the World. And so it did. And News of the World uh, not only 
uh, you know, blasted it through the newspapers, but they put it on the websites, all their websites. Well, Max Mosley sued, of course. This was uh, devastating to him, and uh, he maintained that this was not the type of party he was holding at all, and this is not what went on. Um, so he started in England, and he sued, and he got a sympathetic judge, and he uh, won. And he won, he must have spent, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds on the case, and he won uh, maybe 5,000 pounds. So, he wasn't out of the courtroom at a day, and uh, he noticed that this story started to crop back up on the internet. And we searched his own name, Pop, there was the story, first story in the search. Uh, and the photographs, and so on. And so it was like a pure victory. He'd lost, really, because the, the, his reputation was still right out there. He was still trashed by uh, media. So he has spent the interim, this was uh, maybe ten, 10 years ago, he has spent the interim bringing lawsuits in 22 countries throughout the world to try and get those images all flying. And he has the money to do it, but <clears throat> he made a presentation to what's called Levinson Inquiry in England, uh, looking into press ethics, and he said, this has devastated everyone in our family. My wife has been ruinous, one of my sons has committed suicide, uh, my other son is into drugs, who, know, who knows what, what came first, but, and he said, I... I've had to step down from Formula One. I have no life. This is what I do. I go to court. This is what I do. So, uh, uh, to me, an interesting case study. Does anyone know who this is? Naomi Campbell? That's right. And what happened to her? Do you know? No. Mm -hmm. no. She threw a phone? <laughs> <laughs> she, she did, but no. This, this, story happens to be a lawsuit that she brought against um, a publisher because, a photographer actually, who took photographs of her coming out of a rehab center when she was trying to deal with some uh, addiction issues in her life. She's a very uh, high paid model, successful. And she persisted. It took about four or five years and she brought the case in defamation and invasion of privacy and she won and she won about a thousand pounds. Again, so it was, it was, you know, it was no victory at all. But um, that's the deal. Does anyone know who this is? Um, Courtney. Courtney. Mm -hmm. Courtney Love was the wife of. Kirk yes, and uh, is an entertainer in her own right, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. Singer. And anyway. She was trying to engage a lawyer to look after her estate issues once her husband, Kurt Cobain, had died. And uh, the lawyer would not return her calls. And so Courtney Love tweeted one day, gee, the, they must have got to her. I haven't seen her in days. The, the, the big guys must have got to her. She was sued by her lawyer for the implication that her lawyer was influenced by organized crime, and uh, she lost, and had to pay mightily for that defamation suit. Her lawyers, Courtney's lawyers, tried to argue that, what I just suggested to you before, that social speech, social media speech, is a lower form of speech. It is informal, and it is not to be taken seriously. It's off the cuff, it's in anger, it's written in anger, it is not mediated by an, an editor, and uh, so it's, it's a lesser form of journalism and shouldn't be um, considered. That, they didn't go for that argument at all. Does so anyone know who this young lady is? She's about, it's not a very good image, I'm sorry, but the fact that she's standing in front of a camera holding signs. Is that a YouTuber? Correct. Well, for a particular incident. This is Amanda Todd, but every country has an Amanda Todd. She was 16, and she was uh, coaxed into a chat um, uh, a chat conversation with, uh, with a much older man, 
and uh, enticed to take her clothing off, to take her shirt off. She did, and that man, whom she didn't know at all, he was uh, you know, uh, a child exploitation artist, uh, posted, he created a Facebook page, posted the, uh, the YouTube video, and uh, then people, trolls and all of her class friends and so on, commented on it. So there is a video, I believe it's still on YouTube, uh, she, she doesn't say anything, she just holds up a series of signs like this saying, I will never get my dignity back, I uh, will never get that image off the internet, and so on. And so sadly, she took her own life when she was about 16 or 17. And this fellow's name is Anthony Alonis. Does that ring a bell with anyone? Okay. This, uh, and I'll be quick, this, this to me is, is one of the more blatant examples of how uh, the judicial system is really struggling to deal with this kind of trashing and trolling and so on online. Anthony Alonis um, was angry at his ex-wife and he, uh, on his Facebook page, he started to post a number of um, really threatening um, sentences and uh, fragments. And the one that uh, really uh, came under consideration by the U.S. Supreme Court was, um, there are lo lots of ways to love you, but a thousand ways to kill you. I'm not going to rest until your body is a mess, soaked in blood, blah, blah, blah. The lawyers for Alonis argued that you shouldn't consider the context, the fact that he was, it was his ex-wife and he was targeting these of her and that she then went public and sued him and that prosecutors charged him with uh, death threats and so on. That's what Alonis' uh, lawyers were arguing and they argued that um, writing online and posting things is totally without context and you need context in order to prosecute these or to find guilt, because it's a high legal bar, right, beyond a reasonable doubt. He won. He won. He was acquitted by the Supreme Court of the U.S. because he insisted that these were rap lyrics, that they had nothing to do with his wife, even though it mentioned her name, that um, his intention was not to threaten, not to harm, it was just her perception that she was being harmed and being threatened, and therefore the, uh, the crime was not made out. And he convinced the judges. And finally, this is a, uh, does anyone know this fellow? This is from Missouri Queen. And so tell us a little bit about this. Oh, uh, it uh, it's, was the beginning of Gamergate. And what's Gamergate? Uh, uh, does everyone know? The I'm systematic just... harassment of the game industry. That's absolutely it. That's absolutely it. And, you know, the king of trolls here. And uh, still very uh, defensive and believes that he has a mission. I don't think I'm misrepresenting that. Uh, and he was arrested uh, and uh, um, convicted recently, uh, for uh, uh, jailed for 41 months for several things. Um, but primarily it came down to hacking more than anything. And uh, so he's got some sympathy in certain pockets of the U.S. legal community, uh, especially the Electronic Frontier Foundation. That surprised me. They, are, uh, they have put together a defense fund you know, because they think that this free speech issue goes beyond the way the, uh, the courts looked at it when they convicted him. Um, this, generally, I'm just going to set this up quickly because I, can see, I don't want to take up too much time, but there are generally three ways i found that you can ruin your reputation or your reputation can be ruined. You can do it all by yourself. And so we have the instances of what they call the drunken pirate cases where uh, people get drunk at a party and have a costume on and somebody takes a picture and you post it on Facebook and there it is for quite a while. So that's doing, you know, trashing your reputation all by yourself. There's also data exposure, where um, personal facts about you are let loose in the Twitterverse or uh, the online environment, and they can work to your, to your uh, disrespect or disrepute. 
So there are examples of where people have a socially transmitted disease, and somehow that medical information gets out there, and it can be tied to you as a, as a patient. And so that's not good. And then there's, as we say, the trollers, the, the flamers, and um, a lot of this is done anonymously, and uh, so legally it makes it quite difficult uh, to track this down. And um, they're now, courts are now engaging psychiatrists to take a look at uh, this, and, and psychiatrists speak of such things as the disinhibition effect. The fact that when you go online and you're anonymous, you can take over the world, you can say whatever you want, and there seem to be uh, no repercussions. Um, just briefly, these are some typical responses that are going on right now to this sort of behavior. A woman called Alana Pierce from Australia has some sort of lifestyle or personal style um, blog. She was being trolled and so she found out enough about those trollers uh, to look up the parents and confront the parents and said, are you aware that your children are doing this? And the trollers were quite young. And she felt she got some satisfaction out of that. The second type of response is just to ignore, right? Don't feed the trolls is what, uh, what the advice is. So, um, you know, trolls, those little monsters under the bridge. So unfollow them, mute them, ignore them, try and, and wipe them off the internet or make them go away. And um, as I was reading, the internet is pretty much like a hyperactive three-year-old, you know, needs a nap. Put them down for a nap and ignore them and they'll go away. Um, there's also many reputation firms that make a lot of money. Uh, by helping you to build your reputation online, either by dealing with a negative story or by trying to build up positive stories that will push the negative stories further down in the search order, right? And they are quite expensive. Um, there's also what are called uh, uh, data brokers who collect information about people and sell it back to them. So that really is extortion, think about it. And they will contact someone like Bill and say, Bill, we've got these party photos of you uh, when you were 25, and um, it'll only cost you $400 per picture to take to get those offline forever. And I uh, can see that that's a, a little bit of a con game, and it, not a little bit, it is a con game, and it, uh, it's not going to end well. Um, and then finally, there's the, the issue, the possibility of just humanizing the harm. So I've got again an image of Amanda Todd down here, and it was her father who worked uh, to keep her YouTube video online as a message to the public that this is really what the other side of trolling and flaming look like. So the human response. There's also delete squads, you know. Uh, there are takedown teams um, for all the major social uh, media, and you uh, are now told online how you can go, uh, how you can fill out a form, an application, and apply to have some information about you deleted. The problem is, of course, that you can't call back what has been retweeted or resent to third parties. It's just you can't. It would, it would, it would be a massive undertaking. And finally, recently, there's a lot of conversation about blocking. Ad blocking, information blocking, where you can just try to cut off, um, simply stated, uh, behavioral advertisers and other sources that want to take your data and use it for uh, their own purposes. Now, I'm going to uh, just tell you on this slide that this was the big discovery for me, was that when I started to look for laws that mentioned reputation, I was absolutely amazed. There are six or seven major conventions and international documents out there that make specific reference to the value of reputation and how we have to protect it. So, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Who knew, right? International Covenant on uh, Civil and Political Rights. These are UN agreements that we all sign on to as uh, members of uh, democratic or developed states. Um, another International Convention on Migrant Workers. If you're a migrant worker, 
and a, or, or a member of their family, you have international protection in writing, so in, 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 as a concept in international law. In Convention on Disabilities, people with disabilities, same thing. So on the books, you are, uh, that's a value that as an international community we want to protect, right? And others, the Euro European Convention on Human Rights also talks about protecting our reputation. Other conventions in the EU, the new data, uh, data regulation legislation, it just goes on and on. So I thought this is really strange. As an international community, since the end of the Second World War, we have valued reputation. We've mentioned the word in our documents, in our legal documents. Why then doesn't it appear in our local laws? Or why aren't the judges more informed about this? Why are we more informed on how to respond when the reputation is damaged? I'm going to skip this because I think we're running tight on time. Uh, but just generally, uh, I do then start, I go into thinking about how reputation law in the United States developed very, very differently than the way it developed in Europe. And um, I'm going to move on to <coughs> um, my next thought, which is a project that I put together to see if I can get some uh, support to look at the whole idea of law as it reflects reputation or protects reputation in three particular areas of the world. And I picked three republics, China, the United States, and France. So that I would be comparing apples and apples politically, in terms of political structure. And I would really like to know how historically have these countries perceived a reputation as a value, social value, how has the law responded to that, if at all? And what's the result? How, how well are they doing as a, as a nation, as a um, legal entity, as a country, uh, as a republic, with respect to reputation? These are just comments on the three, uh, three different countries. Finally, what I've really concluded is that um, reputation is a legal anomaly. It's, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit those definitions that uh, law students are taught in the first year about if you have a contract, you must have this element and you must have that element and these uh, particular conditions must be there. Because the problem is your reputation is property. So we could talk about it in terms of property law but you don't have any control over it. So it isn't really property. These glasses are my property, but I also have control over them. So I have a proprietary claim over these glasses. You can't say that about reputation because you don't have that much control over it. Um, law, uh, reputation is also a social contract, but any, anybody can frustrate that contract at any time, right? They can ignore the terms, they can change the terms of how they value you without even giving you any notice. So that legal concept doesn't fit. You could look at uh, reputation uh, trashing as theft, theft of your name, theft of who you are, but there's no giving back. There's no restitution that is going to return you to where you were before the harm occurred, in my view. And then finally, there's the Streisand effect. Anybody want to speak to that? Yes. Censorship only invites more attention. And what happened to Barbara? Uh, she tried to take photos of her house off the internet because, I don't know, for some reason. And because she sued, it got published everywhere. Everywhere. It cost her hundreds of thousands of dollars just in legal fees and didn't, didn't win her case at all. Yes, they were doing, a photographer and, a, and a, uh, an environmental company were doing a project on shore erosion along the Malibu coast. And yes, Barbara decided she wanted those photographs offline and out of the public view. And she's been sorry ever since. So uh, we, we do have the Streisand effect to contend with. Um, 
that's pretty well it because I now want to um, give time to Adam to point out to me how very silly my ideas are and the loopholes in my logic. And so I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. The last thing I would do is to say that this presentation or the project is silly. I, I find it very thoughtful and very interesting. Um, and also um, particularly interesting because you come from uh, a legal tradition that um, is a little bit different, particularly about free speech, although you know, we're both common lawyers. Um, American jurisprudence, I say really in the 20th century, since the incorporation of the First Amendment to the states, has gone off in a very different direction. And so um, I, I think my remarks should be taken in that light, that I think I come from a, a different perspective, um, not only legally, but also I can see theologically. So if you want to dismiss my remarks as, as rants, I I would understand that, that conclusion. <laughs> um, it wouldn't be the first, actually. Um, so um, let me try to um, put this in a, a well, one in a historical perspective, in that you know, people have always been upset about new information communications technologies and have demanded legal responses. I mean, the Roman Catholic Church was no friend of the printing press for reasons very similar to the ones that you point out. People will be able to say anything about it. And we, because you know, we won't be able to control history because you know, before we wrote the books, all the monks dutifully copying in the, in the monasteries, they were able to edit and decide what, what, what history was. All of a sudden, their power was, was challenged by a bunch of you know, insane Protestant divines. So um, that, and, and it was the same set of arguments. We learned to live with the printing press and somewhat argue we're better for it. Um, to use a more modern, relevant example, um, the handheld camera, um, which really was the impetus for privacy torts in the United States, um, were considered a grotesque invasion. Um, uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, um, in fact, banned them from Lafayette Park because the reporters would go and take pictures of his children, who were, you know, you know, bumptious Roosevelt children going, you know, bully, 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 and, and, and <laughs> saying crazy things. And uh, so he, he, you know, that, that would seem outrageous now. Um, but, of course, we got used to the handheld camera. I mean, so the question really is, will we then get used to the, the, the Internet's unique ability to let anyone project to the world? Because that's really kind of what it does. Um, you know, we've always said bad things about each other, we've always, you know, taken embarrassing facts and humiliated other people, but now we can do it to the world and the record of that stays with us. And, and to me, um, that's really the question, and I take that question very seriously. Um, uh, will it be something we just get used to, or will it be something that changes the way we look at the law? So. Let's start with, okay, the law must respond. And I, I follow you know, Eugene Volokh in that any right to privacy, any right um, to reputation, is really a right to make other people shut up. So here's this information, you can't repeat it. And that gives me trouble because I think there are costs. I mean, and that if we're going to go through the process of, identify, uh, of shutting other people up, we have to identify those costs. I'll, I'll return to what those costs are in a minute. Um, but also, as a legal matter, we have to identify the harm. And, and, and for me, from a loyal perspective, I mean, what is the unique harm that we see? I mean, harm to reputation, we already have legal remedies. If you say something libelous, if you say something that um, injures my business reputation, um, if you say something that's false, I can sue you on the internet, uh, regardless of whether you said it in person or on the internet. So. My reputation is already protected. Um, is the question cyberbullying? Um, and that's something different. I mean, you're saying is it the assaultative nature of the internet? Um, well, I, we, you know, as the Supreme Court pointed out, you know, we have rules for what assaults. And they're calling in to tell you. Um, uh, uh, we have rules for what what constitutes an assault, and that words to sort of submit, you know, put in a different context, don't count. Do we want to change those? Do we want to change our definitions of assault? Do we want to expand our definition of reputation? Um, I think there's a very 
interesting and, and good questions, and I might agree with you, but they have to be attacked head on. Um, and finally, and this is this is my my ideological rant, so everyone can you know, tune out at this moment. Um, when we're looking at costs, the costs of uh, 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 of shutting people up, I, you know, I, I think they're significant. Um, you know, I, I look at American campuses today. Um, you know, think about you know the recent you know Halloween costume hysteria, and what I see is a, a widening gyre of intolerance, where people are offended at more and more things, and it creates. You know, Aristotle tells us courage is the greatest virtue because without courage, none of the other virtues have any strength. And what, it, but by expanding the gyre of offense, what we're saying is, you know, you can't handle it yourself. Um, we're making it sort of moral vacillation, um, which I don't think we want to teach children, or I don't think is healthy to um, for the law. So, I, I, again, I, I think this is an incredibly worthy project, and I, I'm with you in the sense that we have to figure out new. You know, we have to really think about how has the internet changed private-public relationship, um, but in a way, your remarks cut really, really deep. I mean, they cut to, I think, basic premises, premises of um, American law and um, our relationship uh, to speech. So that's all. Well, was it, you want to uh, respond before we open this up? Um, I did comment to Adam earlier that I think we're on the same page. I think uh, he's in a, on a different place in the same page, but I think we essentially I think that's true. are on the same We have the same concerns. So that, I think I, no I, more would... interest to us would be what others have to say. Okay. okay. Well, thank you for and that thank response. You. Thank you.